But sometimes in our faith, we lack the art of taking possession. The beginning of your faith can initiate a spiritual transaction, but if the end of your faith does not take possession of the word of God, there can be no manifestation. You will never take possession of something that you don't believe is yours. So can I start off with a little analogy? Is that all right? Break the ground a little bit. Can I just get an usher real quick? I just get this somebody. It don't matter. Yeah, come on, come on. So I'm on, you can just stand right there. And I'm going to sit this right here. Now, does that dollar belong to me or you? Now, this is a trick question. It's a trick question. So does that dollar belong to me or you? Neither one of us. Okay. 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 Why is he unsure? Huh? Why is he unsure? Give, give me some answers. We're going to have a talk back in here today. It's nobody's hand. Okay. Not in possession. Okay. He's unsure, right? Because he does not know if I've given him ownership of that. Right? So guess what? He's got to find out my will. Or guess what? That money will sit there. Right? So now if I tell him you can have that. If I say you can have it. Then what did he do? He took it. Right? Okay. Thank you. You can have it. <laughs> but sometimes that's how it is in our believing. So we are faith people, right? So we know the word of God, right? So the word of God is sitting right there. We reading it. We speaking it. We confessing it. But have we taken possession of it? Come on. Because it's not until he took it that he saw the manifestation of it. Sometimes we're looking at things afar off because by faith we haven't taken possession. So what good is it to say we're faith people, we believe the word, we confess the word if we don't take possession. So let's go to Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33. Now I'm not your orthodox preacher so I'm going to be engaging as you can already tell because I want the people of God to get it I'm tired of us telling the world we save and love God and speaking in tongues and we don't have the fruit of what we say we believe come on somebody okay numbers 33 and 53 notice this this is the Lord speaking to, this is the word of the Lord that he gave to Moses, 53. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. Now jump to verse 55. But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Now this is a spiritual principle, so I want you to look at this a little differently than just reading the story. We're going to get revelation today. Amen? Amen? Jump back to verse 53. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land. So this is a spiritual principle. We're going to take out the word land and we're going to interject a promise of God. So let's say healing or provision or victory or peace, whatever that is. Notice this, and ye shall dispossess. That word dispossess there means to strip it of the authority to remain. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of your peace, your joy, your victory, your soundness of mind, and dwell therein. 
Sometimes we are not taking possession because we haven't dispossessed. Notice what it said. Stripping it of your authority to remain. There are some things that should not remain in your life. Some things just shouldn't be there. Because what did he say in Luke chapter 10 verse 19? Behold, I've given unto you authority is what it says in the Greek. You've been given authority. So that means lack shouldn't dwell in your house. Poverty shouldn't dwell in your house. Murder shouldn't dwell in your house. So notice the first thing he said, you got to dispossess it. In other words, take authority over anything that's dwelling in your land. Because why? I've given you responsibility. See, he just gave them a responsibility. Now, what is the word responsibility? The root word of it is response. It's really two words put together. Response and ability. And really, you can just flip it around. When someone gives you a responsibility, they have given you the ability to respond. Oh, God. (laughs) See, you have the ability to respond to anything that's in your sphere of authority. And notice he gave them the responsibility to dispossess. Now notice this, for I have given it to you. Notice this, I have given you the land to possess it. The word possess means occupation or control of something. Holding, retention, and keeping. Do you remember back in Genesis when he gave Adam the authority to dress it, the garden, and keep it? Or to take possession of it? Sometimes we get it, but we don't hold it and keep it. You know, the scripture said, um, it talks about the word of God. So shall my bird be that goeth forth out of my mouth, shall not return void. Right? But it shall accomplish. Come on, say it with me. And what else? And prosper. Where it's been sent, right? So it has a twofold purpose. Sometimes we just stop at it accomplishing. And we don't keep the word on it long enough for it to prosper. Let's turn over there. That's uh, what name my message, but let's turn there. I think it's Isaiah 55. <laughs> 55 and 11. So shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But notice it has a twofold purpose. The first thing it does is it shall accomplish. Where I please and then it shall prosper in the thing. Notice what happens sometimes. What we do sometimes is if we're believing God for something and say sickness and disease tries to come against our body. We will put the word on it until it accomplishes healing. But we won't keep it on there until it prospers in health. Taking possession means I don't. Lose it. I don't let my grip off that thing. I keep it. I hold it and keep it. Say hold it and keep it. it That means taking possession. Now go back to Numbers 33 and let's jump down to verse 55. Taking possession. So the first thing in taking possession, we got to dispossess anything that comes to distract, hinder, delay, stop, block. Sometimes you got to dispossess thoughts. Come on. Sometimes thoughts will tell you, uh, you won't ever be delivered. You won't ever be free. You'll always be dealing with this. This is runs in your family. Come on, you always going to be broke. You ain't never going to get that job. You'll never get that promotion. You're not good enough. You're not handsome enough, beautiful enough. Come on. Because you've been divorced, because you've been in jail, because you didn't have a record, because you've been molested, because you've been raped. Oh, come on. And so it's causing you to do what? Not take possession. 
so dispossessed. So let's read verse 55. Because it's going to give us a little rebuke here. He's going to give a little, a little spanking here. Numbers 33 and 55. You there? I want you guys to see this because this is very important. But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants. So in other words, if you fail to do something about it. Sometimes we're asking God about some things that he's expecting us to do something about. Can I just teach real quick on the sovereignty of God? Some people say, well, you know, if he wants to do it, he'll just do whatever he wants to do. Well, we as sons and daughters do not operate in a relationship of sovereignty with our father. I'm going to prove it to you. If one of your children come up to me and say, hey, I want some sneakers. Because I'm not in relationship with them. I have a sovereign will to choose whether or not I want to buy them the sneakers or not. And that's my prerogative. But if you as a parent deny them clothing, shelter, housing, what would they say? They will say you are depriving that child. Why? Because that child belongs to you. So when it comes to the father, oh, come on here, somebody. There are just some things because I belong to him. Hey, glory to God. So healing is mine because I belong to him. Provision is mine because I belong to him. Safety is mine because I belong to him. Ah, so, 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 you know, you just heard about the school shooting and some people say, well, I just hope my child don't ever get shot. Guess what? I ain't got the hope. I know. Because I have a promise from my father. I have a relationship. He said I would give my angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Didn't he say in the 91st Psalm, he said a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it don't have to come near you. Because I'm in relationship. Glory to God. The Bible says we are heirs of God. So to be an heir, that has to mean that there is an inheritance. Come on, somebody. And he ain't got sickness. He ain't got disease. He ain't got death. He ain't got poverty. So he can't give me something he don't have. He can only give me what he has. Oh, come on, somebody. So when I ask of him, this is why 1 John chapter 5 said, this is the confidence that I have in him. That if I ask anything according to his will, if I know he hears me, I know that I have the petitions that I desire of him. Why? Because I'm in relationship. So, 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 you know, when we go eat, you know, you go to your, your mama house, if, if, if she's still living, or your family house, you ain't wondering if they're going to feed you or not. And, and, you get, and you get some of them that's good in country, and they like, baby, I ain't even about to fix you nothing. You better go in that refrigerator and fix it yourself. I done cooked. You better go in there and heat something up, right? Because there is relationship. So notice what he told them. He said, but if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, why? Because you have responsibility. Why? Because you have the ability to respond. Why? Because I've given you the authority to do so. Then it shall come to pass, notice this, that those which ye let remain. Sometimes we're dealing with stuff because we let it remain. <laughs> what are you dealing with in your life that you have let remain? You, you didn't let it remain. You didn't let it sit there too long. This is why, let me help you with those that may be dealing with depression or suicide. Or I don't know if I'm able or capable. You have to address that thing really quickly. Because what it's coming to do is rob you of who you are in Christ. And if you're not confident about who you are in Christ, you're not going to take possession. And so sometimes what happens is, is believers, we should never get over into depression. 
you know, I, I, I'm going to just say this and, 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 and just let it be said. You know, I'm, I'm finding out a lot of believers. You know, I'm looking on Facebook and Instagram and believers just, you know, I'm just going through depression and I almost committed suicide and I've been going down. That means that you have let that thing remain. You didn't let it remain too long. You didn't let that thing gain power. You didn't let it give entrance to it. You know, the Bible says the entrance of thy word giveth light. Do you know we can give entrance to other things? Now notice what he told us. He told us to dispossess it. Now when we became born again, we took on the life and nature of God. Victory was built already in our spirit. We were redeemed from the power of darkness, translated, come on into the kingdom of the light. So there's some, we started with a clean slate. Now, when you still got stuff going on in your life that you did when you was back, say that means you let something back in. That means you didn't dispossess it. Just like Adam in the Garden of Eden. All he had to do was speak to it. Why? Because he had authority. But guess what? The Bible says that when the serpent first came to Eve, notice she had the word of God in her mouth. I wasn't going to preach on that, but let's turn there. Genesis, Genesis, Genesis. Holy Ghost showed me this one day and, and I was like, man. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. Uh, yeah, verse 6. Okay, let me tell you the first part for sake of time. So the serpent came up to the woman and said, Let's read verse 2. Genesis 3, 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, Ye may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. She was repeating what God said. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So notice this. She had the authority and she had the word in her mouth. But she let it remain. Notice this. In verse 4. And the serpent said, wait a minute, that should have been the end of the conversation. You shouldn't have let that thing talk no more. See, sometimes we get messed up because we let it keep talking. Oh, y'all don't hear me. I said, sometimes we get messed up because we let it keep talking. That should have been it, period. That, that's the end of the session. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm set free. I'm saved. My children are saved. End the discussion. My children are saved. Come on, when you drop them off at school and you charge the angels of the Lord and you put the blood of Jesus. I know some folk don't know about that blood no more, but, 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 but you surround that school under the blood and everybody attached to that thing. Come on, in your, in your uh, place of business, then that should be the end of that thing. But she let it keep on talking. Notice this. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good from evil. Notice this in verse 6. Lord, I'm off my topic, Jesus. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she saw it. Now, I'm just go real quick and then come back. Notice this wasn't the first time she saw the tree. But why did they say she saw it? Because this is the first time she had ever come out the spirit and started looking at it with carnal eyes. And then the natural, it looked it good. Oh, come on, somebody. See, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a little side journey. This is why you got to stay in the spirit. You ain't got time to be in carnality. You ain't got time to be worrying about what things are going on in the natural. Why? Because you'll start looking at things from another lens. She came from a superior position to a lower position to come see that thing on the level that the devil was showing her. Sometimes you got to keep your elevated position so you can see it how God sees it. Anytime that you get into fear, doubt, and worry, and unbelief, you have come down from your place in heavenly places. Because from your seat is the seat of authority and power and victory and dominion. So if you become concerned, that means you don't come down. So she came down, and when she came down, she saw it look good. And the enemy... Got her to see it from another perspective as if God was holding something back from them. So that's where deception comes in. Is deceiving you that God has withheld something from you or is keeping something from you. And so he's going to give you another alternative. 
This is where we come up with plan B's and C's. He said he was going to make a way. And so we look at options and loans and title pawns and, and can I borrow? And because why? We've stepped from that place in the spirit and we've come to a lower position to reason in the carnal as to how we can get that thing done. Because evidently we didn't believe God the first time. Okay, so let's jump back to 55. Numbers 33 and 55. And those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side and shall vex you. Notice this, in the land wherein ye dwell. Notice this, that means that that thing is right where you are. Sometimes the greatest battles we have is at the house. Sometimes the greatest disappointment, you know, you don't, people don't believe that there's demon spirit. Let me tell you something. The, the greatest demon I believe is be at the mailbox. Sometimes you get bills you ain't, it's like Jesus. I know I ain't made this bill. <laughs> and that's a challenge. What you going to believe? Whose report you going to believe? You could get a doctor's report in the mail. You know, they send everything in the mail. What are you going to believe? What are you going to do when you come to the threshold of your house? That's the place that has to be saturated. We've got to saturate ourselves again. I heard this the other day. You take possession through meditation. And you move from meditation to saturation. When there is saturation, then there's a manifestation. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 1. Or the first division, rather. Psalms 1. We got to go back to saturating our house with the word. Notice this. But his delight, verse 2, is in the law of the Lord or the ways of God or the direction of God. And in his law doth he meditate. Day and night. What does that mean? That means saturation. Day and night. Day and night. Day and night. The word saturation here means applying the maximum possible intensity of coverage. I'm going to say that again. Applying the maximum possible intensity of coverage. I'm going to say it again. Applying the maximum possible intensity of coverage. To fill or to charge to the uttermost. To soak thoroughly. To flood. To overwhelm. To swamp. To overrun. To permeate. To pervade. To overtake. To the point that it's completely smothered. The law of the Lord has to get to that point. What does that do? That goes beyond just renewing the mind. It goes to the point of moving your spirit to another place. See, if we just see confessions as... Just positive thinking. You know, some people say, just think positive. Just speak positive things. No, no, no. It's releasing faith in what is being said and what is being heard and what is being read. It causes there to be a shift in the spirit. What did he say in Job 22 and 28? Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established. But how does that come? That comes through meditation. And saturation to the point that there is the maximum possible intensity. So then your faith is coming to another place. It's coming to another level. It's being released at another place. I'm going to use this analogy because we have Waffle House here. They have this thing called, you, you go there and I've, I haven't eaten there in a while, long while. But they have something called hash browns and they have a special way of getting it. You can have it scattered, smothered, covered, and topped. You can get it scattered, which means they scatter it on the grill, smother it down with onions, 
cover it with cheese and then top it with ham. The same way the word of God is. The Bible talks about the word being seed. So what we got to do is wake up in the morning and scatter the seed. Then we got to smother it with the word. Then we got to cover it with the blood. And we got to top it with praise. Scattered, covered, smothered, and topped is what? That means that thing has been completely saturated. See, if we live our lives like that, then we'll see more of a manifestation of what God said. Now, let's go back to verse 1. I want to show you this. Blessed is the man. Happy, fortunate is the man. To be envied is the man. Favored is the man. Good is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. What is ungodly? Very basic. Not godly. Right? Ain't too deep. The word un nullifies what's coming after it. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Sometimes we think that that's just people. That could be news. That could be thoughts. Anything that's anti-God. Anything anti-word. Anything anti the anointing. Blessed is the man, fortunate is the man, favored is the man that walketh not in the counsel or the advice of the ungodly. Notice this, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, or those that mock. You know, people that mock the word, as the gentleman was talking about the barbershop, sometimes you just got to turn a deaf ear to it. You know, because people try to reel you in. You know, they want to reel you in and talk about stuff. What what you think about it? I don't think nothing. I don't have no thoughts. What the scripture say in Matthew 6, take no thought. I don't take into possession that thought. Let's turn there, Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 and 34. Take therefore no thought. 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 What does that mean? To take a thought means that you've brought it into your possession. Let me just teach this real quick. Every thought that comes to your mind is not your thought. Just because it came... Don't mean you have to take possession of it. When you give that thing entrance. is when you then take ownership of that thing. Some people think I can't believe I thought that thought. That crazy thought came next to my mind. Don't be concerned about what comes to your mind. What you need to be concerned about is what you let in your mind. What do you let take a uh, thought. The uh, thing about a, th- a thought is. A thought is in the imagination realm. A thought will die in that realm if not given access to transition to another realm. I'm going to prove it to you. Y'all want a little exercise? I try to break it up so you don't fall asleep. So I want you guys on the count of three. I want everybody in your mind count to 20. Ready? Ready? One, two, three. Okay, start. Now I want everyone to say your name out loud. Okay, what happened to that count? Stopped. You interrupted it. With what? With words, right? Because words have a higher, it rests in a higher place. And so do you see how you was able to cut that thing off with just your words? So it doesn't matter what comes to your mind. You can cut it off. And it dies in the imagination realm. You want me to show how you know it died? How many of y'all still counting? You're not still counting. Why? Because I was able to shift out of that place 
into another place. So now you're listening back to me. Why? Because my words overrode what was being thought. So when the things say take no thought, it's not until you give meditation to that thing. Because the desire of every thought is to shift over and become a reality. Every thought wants to live. Every thought wants to live. The heinous of thoughts want to live. Murder wants to live. You know, in school shootings, every time, every time, there is a demon spirit present. And it's just talking, talking, talking. And when it finds someone that will give it entrance, then what do they start doing? Acting out on that thing. Let me prove to you that you don't have to yield to it. How many of y'all ever thought I got so mad you thought you wanted to kill somebody one time? (laughs) Got on your nerves real bad. You was like, you know what? Jesus, (laughs) Jesus, <laughs> they're just a little too much today. <laughs> but no matter what came across your mind, you didn't give attention to that. But somebody done gave attention to that thing. And that spirit is telling them how nobody loves them and how people have done them wrong. This is why you got to be careful with the spirit of offense. This is why you got to be careful about how people have offended you. Because what is the enemy doing? He's coming to rob your spirit of faith. Rob your spirit of the word. Contaminate your soil. Because see, once that thought gets in, it's coming to disrupt or dilute. I'm old enough, just old enough to remember that old school Clorox. You know, nowadays, y'all don't know about no real Clorox. See, back in the day, you were scared to get some Clorox on your clothes because... All it took was a little drop because you fool around with that and your clothes was ruined. You might as well throw that thing away. But you know why? We play with it nowadays. You almost be have it shaking and don't even be worried about it. You even put it on color clothes. Why? Because it's been diluted. Why? Because we got Febreze in it, Mountain Sin in it, Floral Sin in it. We got this in it and that in it. And so it's diluted the potency of it. See, the reason why you got to take, take no thought is because that thing is coming to dilute the potency of what's in your spirit. Because, see, you only have one spirit. This is why you have to protect it. The word heart and spirit is used interchangeably in the word of God. So you got to let the enemy know, I'm not going to give you entrance to the same spirit that's going to transport me to the manifestation of what God has for me. Because it's by faith that I shift over where his faith is found in the heart. So you've got to have a permeated, saturated, covered, and smothered spirit in faith and in the word. Or guess what? You'll release it and it'll be diluted. You'll keep talking to that thing and 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 talking to that thing. thing. Why? Because the word has not been saturated to the point that it has been, you have become fully persuaded. And see, when I get fully persuaded... Then it's not no, ain't no long drawn out process. We're making an exchange in the spirit. So notice this in verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted. Planted by the rivers of water or rooted. And shall bring forth fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Why? You can't read verse 3 until you do verse 2. So, you know, we may confess, you know, I'm going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Bring forth fruit in my, my leaves shall not with whatever I do shall prosper. But you cannot take into possession that until you get to meditation. Now, let me go here just a quick because I see this little, little thing coming out now about yoga. And for those of you that are on it, I'm just giving you a word of wisdom. Don't feel condemned. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Now, you can do things like exercise and Zumba and different things of that nature. But let me tell you why yoga is detrimental. Because yoga comes from a Hindu practice of worship. And what they want you to do is meditate. It's about meditation. 
The spirit realm, there's only one realm. And when you get in that realm, some spirit is going to lead you. Anytime you meditate, it should always be on God. Anytime you open up your imagination to that realm, it should only be to honor God to get in his presence to go to his throne. And so when I go in, I go in by way of the blood and the spirit of the Lord takes me in. This is why Romans the 8th chapter, he said, uh, it talks about praying. It talks about how the spirit helpeth our infirmity. Soon as you go in to worship and praise, guess what? The spirit of the Lord helps take you on in. But if I go in, in a, by another way, another spirit will lead. And this is how mediums and witches and warlocks get in that realm. They open themselves up and they have what they call a guide. And a spirit begins to lead and navigate them. So you got to be careful that my meditation is always on God. My meditation is always on the word. My meditation is always to, to ascend to where he is. You know, some people think that that's a way to, to relieve stress. Well, the Bible says in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. So that's a counterfeit way. Okay, so I wanted to drop that little nugget in there because cause, cause, cause I see that thing creeping up and I'm seeing pastors and pastor's wives talking about they doing yoga and I, that, that makes me nervous. Because I'm like, what voice you listening to? What you meditating about? Where you going in the spirit realm? The only place we need to be going is in the presence of God. Now I'm on my way to the end. Turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Glory be to God. The honor of taking possession. Got 10 more minutes. We're almost done. Or less than 10. Mark chapter 5. And verse number 25. And a certain woman who had an issue of blood 12 years. And had suffered many things of many positions. And had spent all that she had. And was nothing better. But rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garments for she said if I may but touch his clothes I shall be made whole. Yeah. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Notice this Mark chapter 5 verse 27. When she had heard of Jesus. In other words when she heard the word. She began to act on the word. And she went out to make contact with the word. Notice it said this. For she said. Who was she talking to? She wasn't yet to Jesus. She was talking to herself. But greater than that. She was having a conversation with him in the spirit. She was having a conversation with the word. At her house. She said, word, I'm going to release my faith at the moment I make contact with your clothes. And so this is why the one thing I love about this story is when she got to Jesus, she didn't have a conversation. It's the only account in the word of God where she never had to ask him something. Why? Because she had already had that conversation in the spirit. She had already taken possession of that thing in the spirit. She was just going to make contact with what already was done in the spirit. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. When did she take possession? Did she take possession at the moment she touched the garment? When did she take possession? When she heard the word. When she heard the word. When she heard the word. So that means the word had already been, had found entrance in her spirit. She already was, 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 cons was convinced that the word had the ability to do what it said it was going to do. So she was like, we're just going to make a transaction in the natural, but I've already handled that thing in the spirit. See, sometimes we're dealing with things because we ain't trying to deal that thing in the spirit. Sometimes we got to get over in the spirit and handle that thing. You know, someone was asking me the other day about a situation they were going through and, and they was like, well, what do you think about it? And I said, it's time for you to get in the spirit and find out what the Lord has to say about that. 
Because in the natural, you can never base things in the natural on what you should do. So never say, because it's like this, I need to do that. Because in the spirit is the realm that initiates. It's the realm that creates. And so whatever you see is only a manifestation of what is happening in that spirit realm. So don't try to deal with the, 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 the limb of the thing, the leaf of the thing. You got to get to the root of the thing. And the root of the thing is in the spirit. In the spirit, she said, when I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. This thing going to be over when I touch that hem. All my suffering, my worry, my, my disappointments, money I done lost. It's about to be O-V-E-R when I touch the hem. And the Bible said she came in the press. She didn't care what the laws had to say about her being ceremonially unclean. See, when you make up in your mind, you get fully persuaded. You stop worrying about what other people think and what you think about and, uh, and what I should be doing. And when you get fully persuaded, she was like, today is my day. She said, this is stopping today. The end of this is today. Same way with Bartimaeus. The Bible said that Bartimaeus, when he heard Jesus had went into the city and he came out of the city, that means he had finished his assignment already. Jesus had done what the Spirit of God had him to do, but Bartimaeus had already penciled himself in. He wasn't scheduled for a miracle, but he penciled himself in. So you can pencil yourself in anytime you want to. It's your faith that causes heaven to respond. Oh God, the Bible said Jesus came into Jericho and he had left Jericho and, 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 and Bartimaeus said, oh, you still got a miracle you ain't did yet. You still got something that I need. The Bible said he began to cry out, Jesus, our son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible said that the crowd began to hush him up. But the Bible said he cried a great deal more. You got to be careful about the things that try to hush you up. If you would learn how to, he, he didn't, it wasn't so much the increase of the volume of his voice. He lifted up the volume of his faith. He increased that thing so much until the Bible said Jesus stopped and commanded him to be called. Your faith can arrest heaven's attention to the point that it's got to come and see what is it that you want. Oh, I got to stop right here. I got to stop right here. I said your faith can get to the point that heaven comes to see what is it that you really want. That's why I like these. I like them two stories. Okay, I'm done. Y'all. I'm done. I'm out of time. I'm out of time. I'm out of time. Okay. I, that's why I like them two stories. Because they faith just penciled them. They just went on in the spirit realm with that thing. They was like, I ain't waiting on nothing in the natural. I ain't waiting to, you know, to get, get you know, I, I'm going to see. I'm going to see what he say. I'm going to see if he going to do it. I'm going to see, you know. And this is why out of the 19 cases that are recorded of Jesus manifesting healing or deliverance, 12 of them, it was according to their faith, be it unto them. Why? Because he wanted us to get to, you know, that's, that's, that's a large percentage, 12 out of 19. So that mean only seven, there was a gift of the spirit necessarily in operation. What the other 12 did is their faith caused there to be a manifestation. Their faith initiated something. Whatever you need, whenever you need it. I said, whatever you need, whenever you need it. Oh, I'm going to say that thing again. I said, whatever you need, whenever you need it. Your faith can make a demand on the word. You don't make a demand on God. You make a demand on the word. And he responds to his word. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I'm out of time, y'all. I'm out of time. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Hey, let's just stand up for about five minutes. Glory to God. And let's just take possession of some things. Glory be to God. Whatever you believe in God for, I want you to stretch your faith out for that thing. I want you to believe for that thing. I want you to speak that thing. Decree it to be so. If you need to walk the aisle, we're just going to take about two minutes. And we're going to decree some things.